Howdy! I think this is my 100th Talking Squid video. I, I, I think. It's, it's hard to keep track. My, my videos are all over the place, and I don't really care about counting them. The, the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology is keeping me busy enough, uh, but I do want to have at least uh, one video a month. So here's a presentation I gave for the class the Foundations of Machine Learning. ImageNet is a dataset containing millions of high-resolution photos, which are classified with 1,000 labels. Can we teach a computer to tell this is a picture of a goldfish, but that is a picture of a CD player? This has led to great competition in the ImageNet large-scale visual recognition challenge, where Google invented dense blocks with their machine learning model Inception V3, and Microsoft invented residual networks with their model ResNet. I'm interested in image classification and computer vision, but uh, ImageNet is a, is a bit big for me. So, um, Mini ImageNet is a dataset of just 60,000 pictures, uh, just 84 by 84 pixels, which are classified with just 100 labels. Uh, like, this is officially labeled an hourglass. I can guess that label, but my goal is getting a computer to do the guessing for me. I have another goal, too. I want to show making a machine learning model more complicated and, and bigger and denser doesn't necessarily make it better. In fact, that might make the model worse. So I've made 39 models of increasing complexity. Let's take a look. This is the simplest model. I call it a linear 21 because it shrinks down the 84 by 84 images to 21 by 21. Then it flattens them into a vector of length 21 times 21 times 3, uh, because the models are red, green, blue. That vector is fed through one linear layer, which turns it into a vector of length 100, of one probability for each of the 100 labels. More complicated models, like linear 42 and linear 84, resize the images to 42 by 42, or keep the 84 by 84 shape. More, more complicated models have a hidden layer of size uh, 128, or 256, or 512. More, more complicated models have two hidden layers. That's 21 models right there. After that are convolutional models. I I've talked about convolution before. This model I call Conv424 because it resizes the images to 42 by 42 and feeds them through a convolutional layer with four channels. The 42 by 42 output goes through max pooling, uh, keeping just the most informative 21 by 21 parts. That is what's flattened and fed through a linear layer to get 100 label probabilities. More complicated convolutional models keep images at 84 by 84, or have a 16, 32, or 64 channels in their convolution. More, more complicated models have two layers of convolution. Uh, that's another 16 models right there. The last two models. I basically threw everything at them I could, <laughs> complex as can be. Uh, the 84 by 84 red, green, blue input is converted to other color spaces, a hue saturation value, a hue light saturation. Um, X, Y, Z, uh, Y, C, B, C, R, and, uh, oh, oh gray scale, <laughs> yeah. All six color spaces each have their own two layers of convolution. They're flattened, stitched together, and that is made into the 100 probabilities uh, for the model's label. I call that model color space. Color space 2 is the same model with extra linear layers. Okay, 
So which models will perform best on Mini ImageNet? And how should we decide which model performs best? The quick answer is by dividing the 60,000 images into a training set and a test set. The models are trained on the training images, and then they're tested on the testing images, which they've never seen before. But we can actually look a bit deeper than that uh, with cross-validation. I split the 60,000 images into 25 groups of 2,400 images, each group having 24 images of each of the 100 labels. Then I made 25 copies of my 39 models. The first copy of each model is trained on everything but the first data group. For uh, 57,600 images, 576 of each label. The second copy of each model is trained on everything but the second data group, and so on. Then we test the 25 copies of each model on their 25 unique test data groups. And that's cross-validation. Did it take long to train 25 copies of 39 models? Heck yeah, but here's what we get out of it. Let's zoom in on the results of the first model, a Linear 21. This box plot shows the worst of the 25 copies of the model was just 9% accurate, guessing probabilities for images in its test data, while the best of the copies of the model was about 11% accurate on its test data. Most of the copies are about 10% accurate. Not a lot of variance. But if we compare this to the box plots for uh, Linear 42 and Linear 84, that's weird. Uh, giving the model larger, higher resolution images made the models less accurate. They're better than guessing labels at random. That would only be 1% accurate. But, well, look at this. If we compare the red box plots, the, the test accuracies, to the blue box plots, the training accuracies, we can see part of the problem. Having bigger photos lets the models overfit. Getting better at classifying the images they train on, but worse at classifying images they've never seen before. Scrolling down, it looks like all these linear models have about the same accuracy. Making the models deeper and bigger didn't seem to help, but accuracies jump up to around 20 to 25 percent as soon as we apply convolution, and having more channels in convolution really helps. So the lesson is, being deeper and bigger doesn't always make a model better. What really works is appropriate model architecture. Google's Inception v3 and Microsoft's ResNet are way bigger than these models, but they also have revolutionary structures like dense blocks and residual networks. So how did my model color space work out? On test data, it was about as accurate as the best convolutional models, but it had the highest training accuracy of them all by a long shot. By giving the model all those color spaces, I was giving it all sorts of ways to overfit. For Occam's razor, there's no need to be more complicated if it doesn't actually help. So I think this model is the best one, a Conv264, with two convolutional layers of 64 channels. Its test accuracy is pretty good, and its training accuracy is pretty comparable. It's not overfitting. Okay, now this is the cool part. <laughs> Let's see some test images labeled correctly or incorrectly by one copy of Conv264. In this very, very big picture, a row is filled with images which are officially labeled with the same label. These pictures are all labeled as house finches. A column is filled with images which Conv264 labeled with the same label, correctly or incorrectly. These are all images the model labeled as house finches. 
This picture is actually of a house finch, but the model called it a robin. This picture is actually of a robin, but the model called it a house finch. Zooming out, the obvious diagonal shows the model is pretty accurate. But you can see this dense column here. The, the model ended up biased, often labeling things crates. Anything can look like a crate. It's a pretty good guess. This is a good time to point out, but even if this model is pretty accurate, and even if this model is pretty helpful somehow, that doesn't mean the model actually knows what it's doing. This picture is a pretty good example. It's actually a picture of a Triceratops, but the model labeled it a Saluki, a kind of dog. <laughs> You'll notice uh, the Triceratops looks like it's in a backyard. It's not labeled a dog because it really looks like a dog. It's a labeled a dog because this looks like the kind of picture you'd take of a dog. There's a, there's a story of a machine learning model which could very well tell the difference between a picture of a dog and a picture of a wolf. But that was pretty easy to do, because the wolves were only photographed on snow, and dogs were only photographed on grass. It's easy to tell the difference between snow and grass. So, as I casually scroll through this picture, remember, even a high-accuracy model, you shouldn't trust too deeply. For instance, um, if, if police had an image classification model which guessed if someone was a criminal or not, it might be pretty accurate, because people are usually smiling in photos, unless it's a mugshot, and then they're probably frowning. So if you're charged with a crime you didn't do, the model would totally say, yeah, they're guilty. You can tell because they're sad. It's a uh, it's very um, minority report. And I don't just mean the movie. Check out a link to this picture in the description. It's easy to find interesting errors. Bye bye. By the way, I've got a Patreon at patreon.com slash thinkster. I want to thank all these squidlings and elder squids. Thanks. <laughs>